Gagat greetings. This is John Glover on this date of December 29th, 2019, celebrating the 29th anniversary of the Gagat discovery. It is important that we recognize the blessing that God has given to us through the formula you see on your screen of GIJ, comma J equals zero, which has infallibly proved or ordained a black man, Professor Gabriel Aldo Yibo, as being blessed with the totality of all intelligence represented by the formula eta sub n, which is the formula which will be coming up in just a second on your screen. Ah, there it was. Eta sub n, which is the formula God has blessed through Professor Ebo to define the net intelligence level or intelligence, and n within that same formula, the n here, is the level of intelligence. God has designed that N for Professor Hebo to be infinity, hence A to sub-infinity. And since God has blessed Professor Hebo with the totality of all intelligence, represented by A to sub-infinity, and black people like ourselves share the same genes as Professor Joe Hebo, God has ordained the black race to be the most intelligent, richest, and most invincible race. It is this blessing that has now forced the world to surrender to the black people. The three surrenders must be focused on, there are many, but there are three that are mainly important. The first one is coming up on your screen, which is the Gauss Year 2005. Gauss Year 2005 celebration, which took place in the year 2005, was a surrender coming from Germany. Göttingen University is a German university, which was the headquarters of intelligence prior to Gagat. Their reason for them being the, or so-called considered to be the headquarters of intelligence prior to Gagat was due to a professor by the name of Professor Carl Frederick Gauss, who was considered to be in the European system, considered to be the greatest mathematician since antiquity, as well as the prince of mathematics. This is, of course, before Gagat. This blessing that we see here in front of us, the surrender, came about when they took the time to celebrate the 150th commemoration of Gauss's transforming in 2005. Gauss lived from 1777 to 1855. In the year 2005, as you can see here in the red writing under the logo for Gottingen on the left side of the page, you will see the list in the middle of all the names, all the works that were selected to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss and which work was ultimately going to win out as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. It turns out that the number one work that was selected to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss is the work of Professor Gabriel Aldo Hebo's Grand Unified Theorem, listed at the very top of the list. Now, it's important that you understand the company to which Professor Hebo keeps in this list of celebrations. It's important to understand the 52 weeks of the year 2005, they selected mathematics works, greatest mathematics works for each week of the year of that year of 2005, and there being 52 of them. Gagat was selected at the week 26, the center of the celebration. As you know, always the most important work is at the center of any celebration, like in a concert. The most important event or the main event is always the center of the event. But again, the point I brought up before about the company which Professor Yubo keeps, you must look at some of the other, other listings on this list to know who could have been in that number one position. If you go to week or NR19 on the list, you'll see the name Sir Professor Michael Atia and Daniel Iago Nitzer, field medalist lecturers. Okay? Who is Sir Professor Michael Atia, you ask? Let's go to his Wikipedia page. Just give it a second, it's loading. Professor Michael Atia, Sir Professor Michael Atia, uh, he transformed earlier on this year of 2019, in January. He was a British Lebanese mathematician specializing in geometry. But what's important to understand is if you go to the second paragraph, you will see here, just, um, it's, uh, just give it a second, it's uh, coming up. Ah, uh, there it is. If you see here, he was the president of the Royal Society from 1990 to 1995, founding director of the Isaac Newton Institute, 
1990 to 1996. But most importantly, the master, Trinity College, Cambridge, from 1990 to 1997. Why is this important? Sir Professor Michael Atia is a successor to another famous European mathematician in the European system by the name of Sir Professor Isaac Newton. Sir Professor Isaac Newton is considered to be one of the top three European mathematicians before Gaga. There's Gauss, there's Newton, and later we'll be covering another one, the third individual by the name of Euler. But what's important to understand is Newton of the three that I mentioned mentioned is the first or the earliest of comic is he was born in uh, as it says here on the page 1642 to 1727 so what's important to understand is he uh, was uh, he came before Gauss did Gauss like I said was from 7 to 17 uh, 1855 so what's important to understand is Atiyah is a successor to Newton who is one of the top three European mathematicians prior to Gaga he is also he has also won an award, which is equivalent in the European system to Nobel Prize, known as the Fields Medal. What is the Fields Medal, you ask? Well, let's take a look. Again, just give it a second as it loads up. The Fields Medal is a prize awarded to two, three, or four mathematicians under 40 years of age at the International Congress of the International Mathematical Union, Mathematical Union, uh, a meeting that takes place every four years. But what's most important is what you see in the second paragraph. The Fields Medal is regarded as one of the highest honors a mathematician can receive, and it has been described as the Mathematician's Nobel Prize. So the Fields Medal is an award which is equivalent for mathematicians which has the same level like a Nobel Prize. And if you scroll down, you will see that Atia won this award back in 1966, 53 years ago. So what's important to understand is Atia is a field medalist. He has won an award which is considered to be the highest award a mathematician can receive or award equivalent to Nobel Prize. If you also look at the list, which, uh, just give it a second, it's loading, so just give it a second. The Field Medal. See, this is the list of the medalists. If you scroll down, just go through some of them, you'll just take a look. You see Michael T. He is in front of you. <laughs> Let's, uh... His name's right here, and the award year is 1966. If you scroll down also and realize that these are the list of the names of the people who have won the award since its inception in 1936. So if you go up to, say, the year, we'll just get to it in a second, 2002, we're going to get there in a second. What's important to understand here is that if you count up the names of the people who have won this award since 1936 up to the year 2002 before the Gauss year 2005 celebration, there are 44 Nobel Prize award equivalents or field medalists, including a TIA. So TIA not only has won award which is equivalent to Nobel Prize, he is also enlisted in the work that was there in week 19 on the Gauss year 2005 celebration, a work that's titled field medalists, as in plural, lectures. That means that the 44 of them, the works, are all contained within that work at week 19. Now, Atiyah being a successor to Newton, whom Gauss had a lot of respect for, could have easily been selected as the number one work to honor Gauss just on that alone. It could have been the, also the fact that he won a Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize award equivalent, which is field medal. That could also have made him the number one work to honor Gauss. And the work at week 19 would say field medalist, as in plural, lectures, meaning all the field medalists. It could have included all 44 of them, 
which in, I mean includes in all 44 of them, that could have made it the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. Gottingen, however, ranked the work of Professor Atia and the other field medalists, all 43, four of them, including Atia, inferior to Gagut, placing it, as you can see here in front of you, seven places below where Gagut was placed. Where Gagut was placed at week 26, Atia and the other field medalists were placed at week 19. What's important to understand here is that Gagut was determined by Göttingen University to be worth more than 44 Nobel Prizes or field medals. That's what we mean by company that we keep. But there are other examples that ult ultimately also explain this point too. If you look at NR23, you'll see two names there, but the second name is the name we'd like to focus on. Anatoly Menko. Who is he, you ask? Well, let's take a look. Just uh, let the page load, just give it a second. Anatoly Timovich Fomenko, you can see in the page in front of you, born in uh, March 13th, 1945, is a, was a Soviet and also a current day Russian mathematician at Moscow State University. Well known as a topologist and a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Now, Moscow State is one of the most prestigious universities in Russia. It's part of like the similar system we have here in America with Harvard and MIT as the highest level in the Ivy League and like Oxford and Cambridge in the U uh, United Kingdom or England. The Moscow State is part of that same university system, highest level in Russia. Now, what's also important to understand is he's also a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Professor Anatoly Fomenko is a successor to another famous European mathematician by the name of Professor Leonard Euler, who I mentioned earlier as part of the top three European mathematicians before Gagut. His page is loading. Just give it a second. Okay. On the screen here you see Professor Leonard Euler, born in 1707, transformed on in 1783. He was a Swiss mathematician, physicist, Swiss-German ma mathematician, physicist, astronomer, geographer, logician, and engineer, who made important and influential discoveries in many branches of mathematics, such as infinitesimal calculus and graph theory, while also making pioneering contributions several branches of topology and analytic number theory. He also introduced much of the modern mathematical terminology and notation, particularly for mathematical analysis, such as the notion of a mathematical function. He was also known for his work in mechanics, fluid dynamics, optics, astronomy, and music theory. But what's most important is what's coming up in this paragraph, which I'm going to read now. Euler was one of the most eminent mathematicians of the 18th century and is held to be one of the greatest in history. He is also widely considered to be the most prolific mathematician of all time. His collected works filled 92 volumes, more than anyone else in the field. So this is where you can tell that Euler, like I said before, along with Newton and Gauss, is one of the top three European mathematicians. But what's even more is this sentence. He spent most of his academic adult life in St. Petersburg, Russia. The same Russia from which Fermenko is in. So this is why we say Fermenko is a successor to Euler. And Euler, like Newton, was also very highly respected by Gauss. New Euler came after Newton, but before Gauss came into prominence in mathematics. But Gauss, even though he's considered to be the better mathematician of the, two, of the three, he also had a lot of respect for Euler like he had respect for Newton. So the successor to Euler, Professor Anatoly T. Fermenko, could have easily been placed as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss due to him being a successor to Professor Euler. Gottingen, however, ranked 
the work of Professor Fomenko, inferior to Gogut, placing it three places below week 26, at the, where they listed Fomenko's work at week 23. So this is again part of the company to which you keep. If you look at NR24, week 24, you will see the name David Hilbert, Knowledge and Mathematical Thinking. Who is Professor David Hilbert, you ask? Well, let's find out. Just uh, give it a second, the page is loading. Ah, yes. Now, on the screen you see in front of you, Professor David Hilbert, born in 1862, transformed on in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. He was a German mathematician and one of the most influential and universal mathematicians of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Hilbert discovered and developed a broad range of fundamental ideas in many areas. He's very well respected as, like I said, one of the great mathematicians, or one of the most influential and universal mathematicians in the 19th and early 20th centuries. He's considered to be the last of the great mathematicians. And if you look at his picture on the right, if you scroll down, which we're going to scroll down, so you can see some more information about him, uh, just bear in mind the computer just has a little lag, uh, just uh, give it a second. You will see here, as you scroll down on the right, the institutions that he's associated with. If you look at what the cursor is highlighting, you'll see the university Ga uh, Hilbert is associated with is the University of Göttingen University. You will see that the university was founded in 1734 by King George II, who himself, even though he's an English king, he was a German, because the Germans actually took over the monarchy in England to control the formula of Newton's universal gravitation law of GM1, M2 minus F, R squared equal, uh, equals zero. So what's important to understand is Hilbert comes from Göttingen. He actually headed the mathematics department at Göttingen after Gauss. So he's a successor to Gauss. It's important that you understand that. If you also scroll down further, you will see the list of doctoral students. Now, as you know, Mathematics is a subject that scares a lot of people because it requires a lot of intelligence. It's not an easy subject for people who don't have the intelligence. And even those who do have the intelligence, it can still be considered to be a difficult subject. So it's considered to be a very challenging subject, even though it's a very godly one. But what's important to understand is, even in Jim Crow system, if you excel in mathematics, the highest degree or level of degree you can get in mathematics is a PhD, which isn't usually easy in mathematics. Now, most mathematicians who are professors, usually they'll be lucky to get maybe one, two, or three students under them to get a PhD. Professor Hilbert has the distinction of overseeing 69 PhDs, or mathematical PhDs, under him. And as you can see here on the right, they're not nobodies. Each one of the 69 students that he oversaw their PhD thesis and defense, you can see they all have their own separate links, hyperlinks to other Wikipedia pages. So it's important to understand Hilbert has a distinction in the mathematics world of overseeing 69 PhDs in mathematics, all of them becoming stars in the field of mathematics. One such PhD of his if you look at the name here, uh, Richard Courant. Courant was one of his students who left Germany because of the, at the time he was uh, in Germany in the 20s, the beginnings of the Holocaust and the Nazis uh, uh, rising up in Germany. He was Jewish, Courant was Jewish. He was forced to leave Germany to come to America. And in America, he has created a prestigious university by the name of, or institute of mathematics by the name of Courant Institute in New York University, which is one of the most uh, uh, respected institutes here in America. So what's important to understand here is Hilbert was his teacher, his professor. And more importantly, 
Hilbert oversaw 69 PhDs in mathematics, who all of which became stars in the fields of mathematics, which is unheard of. So you have Hilbert, who is a successor to Gauss from Göttingen University, whom is celebrating Gauss in this 2005 Gauss year celebration, who has 69 PhDs under him. He could have easily been selected as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. And he's also considered to be the last of the great mathematicians. Gottingen very painfully had to rank the work of their own son from their university, the work of Hilbert to be inferior to Gottingen, which is why, as you can see here on your screen, Hilbert's work is placed at week 24 as opposed to week 26. So this is important for our people to understand the blessing of God through Professor Yibo listing the work of Gagut as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. The company which Professor Yibo keeps defines the nature of this victory God has blessed us with. So now that you understand people who could have been the number one work to honor Professor Carl, uh, Carl Frederick Gauss and how ultimately Gagut beat them all, now the question now must be presented to you which is why was the work of Professor Oyibo, a black man, a Gagutian, selected as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss? It's important, and I just want to take a quick moment to point out something uh, for us as a black people to understand about when God blesses us with people who have been blessed by God with such blessings and victory, how they must be respected and revered through us as a people. A parallel comes from Gauss himself. If you look at the screen that you see in front of you, this is a Deutschmark with the likeness of Professor Carl Frederick Gauss on it. Now, why am I bringing this to your attention? What's the big deal, you ask? Well, let me break it down why it's a big deal. The Germans have understood the importance of honoring and respecting a member of their race that has blessed them with a level of recognition worldwide as a people associated with intelligence. And when they put Gauss on the Deutschmark, they're not doing it for Gauss. This Deutschmark was created in 1999. Gauss has been oh, transformed on in 1855. The reason why they put Gauss on this is to recognize the blessing of what Gauss did for the German people and that they didn't, they did not leave the legacy of Gauss to be disrespected or to be stolen by others. So what's important to see here is the recognition of a blessing coming from a member of their people is honored and respected and venerated amongst their people. The other reason why I bring up this te uh, 10 Deutschmark with Gauss's picture on it is if you look here there's a specific curve or particular aspect of mathematics that I want to associate with you, which will help define the nature of the Gauss 2005 view a lot better. If you're looking at this curve to the left of his face, this curve is a specific important curve in a branch of mathematics called statistics. Gauss made a lot of contributions in various fields of mathematics, whether it be uh, calculus, vector calculus, differential geometry, and so forth, even physics and the nature of electromagnetic flux and things of that nature. But one of the things that he did, although not his most important work, but critical for us to understand in this particular aspect, is what he dealt with in the field of statistics. Statistics is a branch of mathematics which deals with the definition of distribution and classification of data. There's a specific curve in uh, statistics, which you're seeing here on your screen on the Deutschmark, which is what's known as a Gaussian distribution curve, or a bell curve. A bell curve is a specific curve that deals with the distribution of data in respect to a middle point or median, and or deviations or points that go away from that median in both directions. Median meaning a middle point. So what does this have to do with what I was talking about, about the Gauss year 2005, you ask? Well, remember, I just broke down to you that the Gauss year 2005 
was a year-long celebration that took place throughout the entire year. And the entire year is 52 weeks. In order the median point of 52, you just divide 52 by 2. 52 divided by 2 is 26. 26 will correspond to this point on this horizontal axis, which is here. And it corresponds to this point at the very top of the curve, where the cursor is. That point in the curve is where Gogot, the work of Professor Gabriel Aldo Yibo, has been placed. And if you notice, every other point in the curve is below or beneath that work of Gogot. Doesn't matter what week you're talking about outside of week 26. You talk about week 25, week 27, they all are beneath the work of Gogget. And the only work that can supersede the work of Professor Yibo or Gogget's work, which is the highest point or the maximum, absolute maximum on the curve, absolute maximum meaning the highest point in the curve, that, can't, that has no other, it doesn't matter how curve, long the curve goes in either direction, positive or negative infinity, there's no other curve, or point in the curve that will supersede it or go beyond it. The only entity or work that can go beyond the work of Professor Yibo is anything done by the Almighty God, which is what you have to recognize is the blessing of God that coming through a certain people. But well, why is there now you have to go to the point of what I was saying before? Why was the work of Professor Yibo selected to be the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss? This is where we come into the concept of we prove to you all what we say. It's not a matter of us just dictating to you what we say and just telling you to accept it. Here in the ground zero, we prove every point that we make. Gogget, first of all, has defined what mathematics is. Mathematics, in reality, despite all the scariness of the term and the subject to people, Mathematics in reality is defined by Gogot to be the study of theorems. So what is theorems, you ask? Theorems, defined also by Gogot, are infallible truths that cannot change ever. An example of theorem for those in the audience would be 2 plus 1 equaling 3. In a gogotical form, you would say 2 plus 1 minus 3 equals 0. That is a theorem. The wonderful part about a theorem is once a theorem has been recognized as an infallible truth, it does not matter where in space you go, where, it doesn't matter where on planet Earth you go, or in the space, and, and whether in the galaxy, or anywhere in the universe you go, or at any time in the past, or the present, or even the future. An infallible truth never changes. It's true today, as it was in the past, and it will be in the future. Anywhere in space, 2 plus 1 will always equal 3. You can prove it to be true by recognizing the two is a number, if you take your one hand, you count two fingers, that's two. You take your other hand, you count one for the one, one finger, that's that. You have an operation of addition between the two and the one. Operation of addition states that you count two sets of numbers together. When you take the two and you add the one to it, or count the th two together and the one together, you get a total of three. That's how you prove infallibly 2 plus 1 equals 3. And the wonderful part about a theorem is it can never be disproved. There's no possibility of an experiment being conducted that can disprove the number or 2 plus 1 equaling 3. So that's what you have to understand the nature of a theorem. But in the case of Gogget, Gogget has defined mathematics to be the study of theorems. Gogget is also defined from the acronym of Gogget, God Almighty's Grand 
unified theorem. God is defined through God, but the importance of us recognizing through that is that the theorem, unified theorem, the last two words of the acronym are the part we're going to focus on in this proof. All the words that make up the acronym are important. But the last two for this proof are going to be the most important, which is unified theorem. Unified theorem means God that contains all theorems. So we have two definitions here which are essential for our proof. The first is mathematics is the defined by Gogget to be the study of theorems. And two, Gogget from the acronym definition, God Almighty's Grand Unified Theorem. Gogget contains all theorems from the unified theorem part of God Almighty's Grand Unified Theorem. We are now going to take the two statements or definitions that we have. And we're going to use those definitions now to prove why Gauguin was selected to be the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. Since Gauguin defined mathematics to be the study of theorems, and since Gauguin from its definition contains all theorems, one now can infallibly deduce that Gauguin contains all of mathematics infallibly. And it is upon this proof that forced the Germans, the highest level in Jim Crow system, to actually declare the work of a black man as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss. In effect, surrendering to the black people. Because when they declared the work of Professor Yibo as the number one work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss, they have just recognized God that contains all mathematics. So when you recognize God that contains all mathematics, it means the work of Atia and the other 43 field medalists at week 19 are all reproducible and contained within Gagat. The work of uh, Fomenko at week 23 is contained and reproducible out of Gagat. The work of Professor David Hilbert at week 24 is reproducible and contained within Gagat. The work of Newton is contained within Gagat. The work of Euler is reproducible and contained in Gagat. Uh, well, I'm sorry about that, just a second. The work of Riemann, who we're going to be getting into later in the broadcast, is reproducible and contained out of Gagat. And even the work of Professor Carl Frederick Gauss, to whom the celebration was dedicated towards, his entire works can be reproduced and are contained within the work at week 26. Gagat. The Germans had no choice but to surrender. And that is why they now officially, by declaring Gagat as the greatest mathematics work to honor Professor Carl Frederick Gauss, they have in effect taken the baton of excellence from Gauss, who before Gagat was considered to be the greatest mathematician of all, uh, at that point, they have now handed it over to Professor Ebo and have officially declared that Gagat has declared Professor uh, Gottigan, excuse me, has declared Professor Ebo as the greatest mathematician of all time. That can never be surpassed. Past, present, and future infallibly. Because Gaga contains all mathematics, it means every mathematics equation in the past, whether it be quadratic formula, kinematic equations in physics, any type of differential equation, all equations originate out of Gaga. All current day mathematics works are all contained within Gaga. And all future, this is the one that gets everyone, all future mathematics works are contained within Gaga. What this means is if we zoom or go and fast forward to the year 2071 A.D. If someone tries to claim then they have something new in mathematics, it is still all contained within Gagat. You can fast forward further to the year 3070 A.D. If someone claims to have come up with something new in mathematics then, it is still contained and reproducible out of Gagat. You can force that forward to the year as far as you'd like, like 10 billion A.D. 
even as far into the future as that seems to most people. If someone then tries to claim they have something new in mathematics, it is still contained and reproducible out of Gawker. And you have to also remember the Germans, the whole design by Jim Crow prior to Gagat, which is one of the other reasons why we must celebrate this victory of Gagat and its 29th anniversary, is before Gagat, there was an active design by Jim Crow to keep black people out of the running for even this particular search on Gagat, or what they were looking for, which is unified field theory. Black people automatically kept from the mathematics and the sci heaven and physics and the heavy sciences in order to make sure they could never even be, they were precluded from the, even finding it, let alone be part of the search. Gagat, however, bless, uh, God blessing Professor Lippo with Gagat, forced not only a black man to be in that search despite all odds, but more importantly, it forced the Germans, who were the highest level or echelon in the European system, not only to put a black person on this celebration list, but at the very top of that list. This is the surrender. We all must say, praise God! Four. And that's the victory we're celebrating now on the 29th anniversary of the Gaga discovery, which since it's been around since 1990. Now, the Gauss year 2005 is a very powerful celebration on its own. But it was not in isolation. We have other surrenders that took place around the world, and that brings us to the east of Europe, which is Asia. And more importantly, particularly, we're going to be focusing on India. Now, just give the page a second, it's loading. What you're seeing here is an abstract of a, a research paper in mathematical physics coming and emanating from a very important Indian university by the name of Jamia Milia Islamia. Why is that important, you ask? Well, first, let's read the title and the authors of this research paper, and I'll go into that. The title of the paper is Gauge Conditions for an Abelian Churn Simon System Consistent with Equations of Motion. There are four authors, There's, but the, first, the third name is the name I would like you to focus on, which is Krishnendu Dasgupta. Krishnendu Dasgupta is an expert in mathematical physics. He is part of the Department of Physics at Jamia Milia Islamia. Jamia Milia Islamia is a top 19 school in India. It was also funded by the King of Saudi Arabia. And it was also a very influ influential or uh, very important uh, university in the independence of India from English rule or British rule in the 1948-1947 time period. So what's important to understand is that Jamia Milia Islamia is a top 19 school in India. Professor Krishnendu Dasgupta is a mathematical physics expert from the Department of Physics at Jamia Milia Islamia. And this is a research paper. You're seeing an abstract of that research paper in front of you. So what is the, why is this important? The Indians have won a great deal of Nobel Prizes in what the Jim Crow system was looking for, which is a unified field theory. A countryman of Chandra Sarkar back in 1983, uh, Chand, uh, excuse me, a, a countryman of Dasgupta, uh, who was another fellow Indian by the name of Chandra Sarkar in 1983, won a Nobel Prize for what's called the Chandra Sarkar Limit. Another countryman of his by the name of Abdus Salam won a Nobel Prize along with two European mathematical physicists for what's called electromagnetic weak unification in 1979. They won a Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize together. So what's important to understand is Indians have won a great deal of Nobel Prizes in, for the search for unified field theory, which is what they were looking for. And Dasgupta himself, being a mathematical physics expert, himself was looking for this particular formula, uh, for a universal, a uni, uh, unified uh, field theorem. So what's important to understand about Dasgupta is Dasgupta comes from a country that has over 1 billion people population. India is over 1 billion people. In addition to that, Indians also, unfortunately, which is part of the reason, like I went over with Gottigan, how there were systems in place to preclude black people from even being in the running, and how Gaga triumphed over them all. In the case of Dasgupta, 
Dasgupta comes from a system in India called the caste system. The caste system in India, like Jim Crow, is a system that classifies people on skin color. The so-called lighter-skinned Indians are in the so-called highest levels in Indian society. When you get into darker shades of skin color, they are in lower levels in the Indian system. When you reach the actual black people in India, they are the lowest level in that system, and they are referred to as Dalit, or untouchables. And this system has been in place for several millennia, or several thousands of years. It's not something that has taken place just within the last couple of years, or last decade or so. It's also important to understand because of before Gagat, the Indian people have been tolerated slightly better by other non-blacks than black people are tolerated by those non-blacks. So the Indian people have, have been fooled into a mentality of thinking themselves before Gagat as being better than black people, even to a point where if a black person is of a lighter skin tone than an Indian, before Gagat, the Indian would still think of themselves as being better than that black person, even if they were darker skin color. So this is the background Dasgupta comes from. Dasgupta also comes from a very heavily Islamic background in India. So that's also important, a very heavily religious aspect is there as well. When Dasgupta heard that a black man from Gagatya, our proper homeland and name for our continent, he heard that a black man like Professor Oyibo had been blessed with God Almighty's grand unified theorem, G-I-J comma J equals zero. He was compelled to write to our university a letter. And that letter is very important for us all to understand, which I'm going to go over for you right now. He wrote this letter back in July of 2007, as you can see in front of you. From Krishnendu Dasgupta, sent on Wednesday, July 25th, 2007, 9.24 a.m. Subject to Professor Yibo, as you can see. Subject, God's Mission and Dasgupta. Dasgupta in that title is testifying and swearing about what he's going to articulate in the message. And the letter reads as follows. Dear Oyibo, good day. I've heard that you've been successful in finding the unified field theory. Congratulations. You are more close to God than any of us. You are more close to God than any of us. I was also working upon this theory. Since my theory was different, God was different to me. Please write to me, as I would like to know where I was wrong. Thanking you, yours, Krishnendu Dasgupta. What you have just heard and witnessed here is the final destruction of the caste system forever. And another surrender that Gagat has brought about for the black people. Why is this essentially important for us, as I just illustrated about the destruction of the caste system? Like Gartigan, as I was going over with the previously before God blessed Professor Ebo of Gagat, Jim Crow had all measures of pre preventing black people from even being in the front running or even in the running for the solution to the problem. Gagat busted all that, just like Gagat busted the fraud of the caste system. The caste system was thought to be something that could never be ended. Gaga demolished the caste system forever. But well, also what's important to understand is by Dasgupta, an Indian, declaring a black man as being more close to God than any of us. That is a complete diametrically opposed position from the view in the caste system of black people to being so-called Dalit or untouchables. You can't be so-called the lowest in the system and then now be declared as being more close to God, which is the highest level you can achieve as a human being or any creature. So what you have to realize is this now diametrically opposed position has been brought about by Gagat, and Gagat forced this surrender from the Indian people represented by Professor Dasgupta. The other point that's also important to understand is the following. 
as I mentioned earlier, comes from a system which is very heavily Islamic inspired, or a very strong Islamic part of India. There was a countryman of Dasgupta, well, he's still around, but he was in the, in the 80s, late 80s, in 1988 exactly, a man by the name of Salman Rushdie, an Indian author, wrote a work called The Satanic Verses. The Satanic Verses was a work written by Rushdie in 1988, which gave account and a fictional account on Muhammad. Even though the work was fictional, the followers of Islam were so enraged by this work, and they considered it such an affront to Islam and, and uh, the Islamic religion. In 1989, 30 years ago, the Ayatollah of Iran, at that time in 1989, he made a public call of all followers of Islam. He called upon the followers of Islam to assassinate Rushdie for the work of the Satanic Verses due to what they saw was an affront to the image of Muhammad in that work. And if the English had not rescued Rushdie in India at that time, the followers of Islam would have murdered him or execute, uh, assassinated him. In, after that order from the Ayatollah of Iran. So this is the same India, same Muslim background that Dasgupta is declaring a black man as being more close to God than any of us. When Dasgupta declared Professor Ibo as being more close to God than any of us, he did that in the area he knew was a very heavily Muslim-influenced area. And in Islam, the most venerated and uh, most revered character in Islam isn't even Allah, but is Muhammad. So when Dasgupta declared Professor Yibo as being more close to God than any of us, he didn't say Professor Yibo is more close to Muhammad or approaching Muhammad or being a prophet like Muhammad. He said Professor Yibo is more close to God than any of us, which means... Professor Oyibo supersedes Muhammad. It's very important you all understand this point. And you have to realize that in a country that was willing to assassinate Rushdie for a fictional account of Muhammad, that a man declaring a black man as, like Professor Ibo as being more close to God than any of us, superseding Muhammad, could have easily had him having a fatwa or an assassination declared upon him by the followers of Islam. However, I'm pleased to tell you, as of this date of December 29th, 2019, there has been no fatwa declared on Dasgupta, and Dasgupta is alive and well, because Dasgupta articulated an infallible truth one that cannot be challenged by anyone. And in the process of him declaring this infallible truth, he is protected. No one can touch him. So that's important to understand the blessing that God has blessed us with. God that not only forced the surrender by Asia, represented by Indian Professor Dasgupta, but it also has forced the surrender by religion. And it's also important to understand, in the case of Dasgupta, the situation is also analogous if you were a Christian. In Christianity, the most revered character in Christianity isn't even God, but Jesus Christ. So when he declares, Dasgupta declares, Professor Yibo is more close to God than any of us, he's not saying Professor Yibo is a messiah, or approaching Jesus, or being like a, um, Jesus. He's saying Professor Yibo is more close to God than any of us, meaning Professor Ebo supersedes Jesus Christ. Now, most audience members from that last sentence alone would want my head in a platter saying I'm blaspheming, but no. The infallible proof of why what I said is true all comes down to the nature of what God blessed Professor Ebo with, which is the formula G-I-J, comma, Jake was zero along with eta sub infinity intelligence. And I challenge people all the time, and I'll provide that challenge then, again, since we have not heard anyone that can challenge or contradict this point, 
which is, tell me where in the Old or New Testament where it is ever described that Jesus had any mathematical ability or it was rigorously proven theorems or has a formula, mathematical formula attributed to him and where his published works were and how he defended it. The same goes to Muhammad as well. Where in the Quran do they ever specify Muhammad having any rigorous proofing or mathematical ability or formula like God could? They don't. Neither Jesus nor Muhammad have such a formula. In fact, neither one of them has ever been attributed to having any mathematical ability at all. That is the infallible proof of why Professor Ebo supersedes both Jesus Christ and Muhammad. So you have to recognize the surrender from India, represented by Dasgupta, is just like the surrender from Europe, represented by Gottingen University. Gagat forced them to recognize a black man, Professor Gabriel Aldo Ebo, as being blessed with the totality of all intelligence. And in this surrender, they are now recognizing black people who share Professor Gio Ebo's genes as being the race that are the most intelligent, richest, and most invincible race. Because you have to realize, when Dasgupta declares Professor Ebo as being more close to God than any of us, we as black people, we share the same genes as Professor Dasgupta, uh, Professor Ebo. So that means, we are more close to God than any other race. It's infallible. So that's the point that must be digested. So those are two major surrenders. But now we have what happened in Europe. We had what happened in Asia. What about where we are right here in America? What has happened with God now? Well, let's now go to the third surrender, which is important for us to understand. It's important to understand and Gagat, as we're celebrating the 29th anniversary of Gagat. Gagat has been around since 1990. Once Gagat came through Professor Yibo in 1990, it forced the world to change the understanding as well as the image and reality of the black people. Before that recognition of God blessing Professor Yibo with this ultimate infallible solution to all problems through Gagat in 1990, Jim Crow very fraudulently labeled black people through three-fifths, a very deadly factor to prevent us from being able to live life as we're supposed to, as members of the race who are the most intelligent, richest, and most invincible race. But after 1990, God blessed Professor Yibo with the solution to all problems. And one of the problems God had solved right off the bat was the nature of our intelligence. Jim Crow recognized Professor Yibo's intelligence to be eta sub infinity. And you have to realize eta sub n, as I went over before, is the formula representing intelligence. Once they recognized Professor Yibo's intelligence level, which is represented by the n in eta sub n, to be infinity, they recognized that they now had to revise the scores of the intelligence of the black people because the IQ scores black people have been given have been fraudulently uh, factored in a three-fifths factor which has contaminated the reality of the results of those tests. So what needs to be recognized is the three-fifths factor must be removed out of the black people's intelligence scores. And that is what you're seeing here on your screen, which is this Gogget Yale study. This Gogget Yale study was conducted in 1997 under the order of President Bill Clinton. Clinton, who was the president during 1997, during that year, he was ordered by Gogget to conduct a testing of the black people's intelligence to reveal the reality of the black people's intelligence. And this was conducted in a gene in journal, International Journal of Gene and Genomes, in 1997. The title of this research paper is Nuclear DNA Diversity in Worldwide Distributed Human Populations. Why is that important? First, let's take a look at the people who are conducting this research. If you look at the names, if it's not clear just looking at them, these are non-blacks conducting this research. Now, why is that important to point out? This is not a couple of brothers and sisters from some HBCU 
conducting some feel-good research here. This is Jim Crow non-blacks taking eight to sub N to the labs to get the correct IQ score for the black people. The best name that exemplifies this is the name here, which I'm circling with the cursor, Kenneth K. Kidd. The initials are K. 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 Telling you who is conducting this research. In addition, if you look after Kid, you'll see a superscript B. The superscript B, if you go down to the legend, what does it correspond to? It corresponds to the following university. Yale University, School of Medicine, Department of Genetics, 333 Cedar Street, New Haven, Connecticut, 06510. That is why this is the Gog at Yale study. This is being spearheaded by Yale University. And some of the other universities associated with this research study, so you understand this is not black people in the HBCUs conducting this, are the following. You'll see universities in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in French. You'll see Rome, universities in Rome, Italy. you see university, and here other American universities of Pennsylvania State University and Louisiana State Universities, neither of which are HBCUs. So this is Jim Crow conducting this research to determine the proper IQ score of the black people. So what was the result, you ask? One doesn't have to look any further than the abstract. The abstract is in front of you all right now. Now let's go to line four. If you ignore the American Indian populations, let's go to the beginning of the next sentence, which says, in this way, the European bias in the nuclear polymorphism ascertainment has been avoided. A lot of words there, but let's break down what they mean. First of all, let's start with European bias. What is European bias? European bias is a synonym for Jim Crow. And what they've just said in the sentence is they had to remove the European bias in order to get the correct result of the intelligence. Because polymorphism is a definition defined by Goggett as a mapping of several points in space onto one point in another. Like your eyes map several points in space into your brain. That's one example of a polymorphism. And the more polymorphisms any creature has, the more intelligent the creature is. There's a direct correlation to the number of polymorphisms a creature has, to a number of, uh, to the intelligence of that creature. Animals like squirrels, rabbits, uh, turtles, birds, all of them have the level of polymorphisms, but they're nowhere compared to humans. They're very low. When you get into higher animals, like say primates or hominids, they have higher than the, like the, the dogs and the squirrels and the uh, uh, turtles, but they're still not as high as a human. When you get to humans, as we determined here in line five, uh, six, humans have a base number of polymorphisms of 15. Now that doesn't matter whether you're a black person or a Gagutian or non-black or non-Gagutian. Either way, you have a base number of 15 polymorphisms. So if we really read line six, it says 15 polymorphisms were shared among most of the populations compared. Whereas 13 sites were found to be endemic to Africans and four to non-Africans. So now what does that mean? As I said before, humans have a base number of 15, whether you're black or non-black. But they said specifically that there are 13 that are endemic to black people or additional to black people. 15 plus 13 is 28. What they've just said here, and this is the official position of the United States government, 
that the intelligence level or the N for the eighth cement for black people is 28. For your non-blacks or non-Gagatians, your whites, your Asians, your Jewish and Arab peoples, they have four additional to the 15. So 15 plus four is 19. Their N is 19. So if we were to take a ratio of the black people's intelligence to the non-black people's intelligence, that is a ratio of 15, sorry, 28 to 19. Now, Jim Crow often underestimates what black people's real scores are. The proof of that is the for all the fraudulent three-fifths adding to the IQ scores of the black people. So when they declare 28, we know it to be higher than that 28. And Jim Crow does the opposite when they deal with themselves. When they talk about themselves, they're always overestimating themselves. So when they declare themselves as having 19, we know it to be less than that 19. So that ratio is going to be rewritten a bit. 28 to 19 is going to be rewritten as 28 plus to 19 minus. Now ratios can be converted into a fraction. 28 to 19 or 28 plus to 19 minus can now be rewritten as 28 plus over 19 minus. That in reality is the true intelligence ratio of the black people. But unfortunately 28 over 19 isn't exactly very simplified to see the impact of what that number means. So let us realize that because 28 in reality is 28 plus for the numerator, the upper part of the fraction, and 19 is really 19 minus the bottom number or the denominator of the fraction. Let us round the numbers so we can get it to be a little more simplified for us to understand what's going on with this ratio. 28 plus, let us go up to the next divisible number, whole number that is. 29 doesn't work because 29 is what we call in mathematics a prime number, a number that is only able to be produced by itself being multiplied by 1. It has no other factors, whole number factors, that can equal 29. I mean, when you multiply them together. But let's go to 30. 30 has several different numbers outside of 1 and 30 that can equal 30, like 5 times 6 or 3 times 10. So let's round up 28 plus to 30. Let's round down 19 to the next divisible whole number, and that is 18. 18 has several factors that can be broken down that are beyond 18 and 1, like 6 times 3 or 9 times 2. So the fraction now, 28 plus over 19 minus, is approximate, not equal, but approximate 30 over 18. 30 over 18 is a fraction that can be simplified because both 30 and 18 have a common factors amongst them, but the greatest common factor between both the numerator and the denominator, in this particular case, is the number 6. If we divide 30 by 6, you get 5. If you divide, so our new numerator is 5. If you divide, sorry, if you take 18 and divide it by 6, you get 3. The new denominator is 3. So 30 over 18 is equal to 5 over 3. In mathematics, 5 over 3 is what we call an inversion, or more importantly, a reciprocal to 3 over 5. So now you have to realize Gagat not only destroys the three-fifths labeling, but forces the world to now recognize our real reality is we are the most intelligent race with the intelligence of five-thirds. This is why we have to say, praise God! and celebrate the victory God has given to us through Gagat. It's mathematical, it's scientific, and it's official. 
after 2,500 years of fraud regarding the reality of the black people, ever since the Greeks and the Arabs invaded Gargutia. God is now returning our reality back to us through Gargut. It has forced the rest of the world to surrender like it did at Gottingen, like it did at Jamia Mili Islamia, and like it's doing here in Yale, which is now representing the official position of the United States government. So now it's our job to celebrate that victory, and we must celebrate it as a people. God blessed us with such a victory, and we must understand the parallel between such a blessing and what people have done with such a blessing, how it protected them. The Jewish people celebrated their victory with relativity by making sure they raised a budget for relativity. And when they did that, that's how they not only protected the legacy of E equals MC squared or E minus MC squared equals zero for the Jewish people, it's how they said never again to the Holocaust. They raised a budget through their people, people equivalent to like Bamberger, Louis Bamberger, who was a Jewish businessman who was able to raise millions of dollars for relativity through the IAS, Institute for Advanced Study, and people like Flexner, people who may not have had the millions personally by himself, but through his connecting with other Jewish people in the synagogues and the community, they were able to raise funds for creating a millions of dollars through a network or a group of people together, Jewish people together. They were able to raise millions of dollars in the tune in 1930 when they raised six million dollars for relativity. You have to realize they did that in the midst of a depression. They had the will, they had the understanding, and they understood what they needed to do. So black people have been blessed with the formula where if you compare relativity to Gagut, relativity is but a subatomic particle compared to Gagut, which is the totality of all space, the infiniteness of space. So what's called upon our people right now is our people coming together through the Gaga, each one reach many, and reaching their best friends and closest relatives to provide the budget for us to do projects with Gaga. It's important that everyone listening to this broadcast, they call us at 631-242-3069. Right away to do this, because this is the way we praise God and show our blessing, show our respecting God for the blessing God has given to us through Godhood. Godhood is what forced these people to surrender. That is why we're celebrating the 29th anniversary of Godhood today. But we all have to recognize our part in this. We have a duty to glorify the Almighty God for such a blessing. And that's why it's a call in the pot us. We call 631-242-3069 to raise the budget for Godhood. So we can now live life as God intended us to, as the race that is the most intelligent, the richest, and the most invincible race. As I stated before, it's mathematical, it's scientific, and it's official. This is why we must say all times, Praise God! For the blessing of Gagat. And to protect the legacy of Gagat for ourselves and our future generations. This is what I bring to you today. And I'm hoping that you all understand and internalize this message. 